Hello, this is Louise Jameson, and you're listening to The Sirens of Audio. G'day audiophiles, this is the Sirens of Audio and my name's Dwayne, I'm your host and hosting alongside me is... Philip, how are you going Dwayne? Good to see you. How have you been over this last couple of weeks since we've, uh, since we've got together for a recording? I have been excellent. We um, went away to Port Stephens, which has been uh, three hours north of Sydney with the family. So lots of swimming, lots of time on the beach. It was a lovely time away. And I can see you're sitting in a car somewhere, so you're still travelling, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I'm still travelling. But today I went to this remote animal farm and I thought, oh, yeah, it's going to be native animals, going to be the usual kangaroos and all these other different animals. But what I didn't expect was that the koala feeding, because I've been to koala feedings before and they don't, they hardly even let you touch them. You've got to virtually stand back and... I said to them, oh, can we, can we hold these koalas, maybe get a photo? They said, oh, no, but you can, you can pat them. Anyway, we went up to the koala feeding, and down come these two koalas with little babies on their backs. It was the most gorgeous thing I'd ever seen, and we, could, we were allowed to touch them, pat them, get right up in their face, and I couldn't believe that the mothers just didn't care. They're as tame as anything, and it was something I didn't expect to experience today, but I'm very glad I did, and the, and the kids loved it too. It was awesome. Yeah, it's interesting. I went to a koala sanctuary last week with the kids. So it's a hospital, a koala hospital for sick koalas. We visited there and I learned, I, I thought I knew a lot about koalas, but they've obviously done a lot of research since last time I looked into them. And yeah, lots, lots of interesting, interesting information. I don't know how they survived because they really are a unique, useless species. <laughs> they they're pretty are, because That's right. There's only one thing they'll eat pretty much. And... Yeah. Yeah, they 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 sleep what twenty hours of the day, something like that. So, yeah, well, what they eat poisons to them. It's just it's just that they've got bacteria in their gut that deals with the poison. But for any other species, what they're eating is deadly. And if right. they move outside their range of trees that their mother used to eat from, they'll die as well. So they're actually limited to the trees that the, their mother eats from when they're born. It's just yeah. Anyhow, we're not here to talk about koalas. Well. Oh, it was it just the koalas made me think of Frobisher, you see. So Frobisher could be the, a, a koala. We've got a panda in I, Iris Wild Time. So Big Finish does have the occasional cute, cuddly creature in there that I'm, I'm expecting them to come up with some kind of an idea for uh, a koala at some point. There you go, Big Finish. All right, but today we are going to be speaking with a legend, shall we say, in terms of big finish and that's John Dorney so uh, I bet you're looking forward to that one Philip. I really am it's it's interesting that his name has come up a few times with people we've spoken to I know Louise Jamison just adores John and she can't speak more highly of him his name's come up with other people as well and his output is amazing so yep I'm looking forward to speaking to him we should get to it. Yeah it's going to be great one of the most recent projects that he was involved with for Big Finish was Time War 4. That was probably one of the most recent releases of his. So we'll chuck in a trailer for that one right now. From Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, The Eighth Doctor Adventures, The Time War, Volume 4. We are from another universe. One that was at war, or rather one that had recently been at war. We have knowledge of the future. We have to take advantage of that. Ah, oh. oh, Davros, there you are. You're up. You surprise me every day. The time strategist, he's coming for you. Stop him! They're all going to die if you let him do this. You are the doctor. You are the enemy of the dark. Now listen, listen. You don't look quite yourselves. I I'm sure if we had a chat, we... <laughs> it's party time! <laughs> Shut up and don't move. Uh, sorry, who are you? You don't know. Never seen you before in my life. Stop! Come on, make a move. 
I'd love you to find out exactly what a Dalek gun does to someone. Exterminate! We will return, restored, stronger, immortal, and we will rain down fire upon you and all your people! Big finish. We love stories. Whole planets have shifted. Some have vanished altogether. War is over. But there is no peace. Listen, thanks so much for your time. Really my pleasure, appreciate my pleasure. You Thank you for having me. So, uh, what I'd love to start talking about is just in terms of, um, we have told us a bit where you come from. So, you've got, where, where were you raised, brought up? And so, where, what's childhood like for you? Um, well, I was, I was sort of always um, kind of London-y. Um, I was brought up kind of on the fringes in a town called Epping, which is genuinely at the moment, though it wasn't then, the furthest you can pretty much go i'd say east north ish um on the underground it's the end of the central line in in, in london um and that's where my family lived it's probably um the, the the cheapest way of living on the fringes of london my mum uh was a londoner um from a sort of working class background and still insists that she's working class even though she clearly isn't um and my oh, dad oh. yeah my dad was um an environmental health officer from Australia, who'd come over and met my mum doing um, amateur dramatics. Uh, so I was basically brought up in, in initially for the first 10 years, right on the fringes of London, then slowly moving out into what they call East Anglia, um, which is kind of the, the bit on the right, um, before eventually moving back in to go to drama school, back into London and, and spending the time in London. I, so I'm basically, I am a Londoner, um, even though... It, it, I, I think, um, as you can probably tell, my, my accent doesn't sound very Londony, very estuary. Um, yeah, I, I think I think that's at least partially down to the fact that my mum had sort of wanted to be an actor and so it poshed up a bit. Um, Puppy. Uh, yeah, a little bit, a little bit of that. And um, and my my dad was probably kind of influenced by her accent, so we all came. Across, I was I was kind of bullied at school a bit for being a bit posh. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, whereas so I don't actually think I am that posh, I'm not. I'm certainly not. Like, it's, this isn't like the the full RP. This is just kind of like a relatively flat. Um, you, well, you know, I was going to say accentless, but then going, everyone thinks they're accentless, don't they? Really, it just is clear for everybody else rather than yeah, because you're kind of used to your own voice. Yeah, so that's where I came from. And I basically, um, yeah, became became an actor after a while. I, my, we were always quite interested in the arts. As I say, my my, my dad had wanted to paint. My mum had wanted to be an actor, and I think because neither of them had quite managed to pull that off, they were quite actually keen to encourage uh, me and my sister to get involved in the arts to our. our our varying degrees um yeah and um i just um read a lot i really liked fiction i kind of that was always the thing that really grabbed me um so i i liked reading and i liked writing and i still kind of do really yeah so what was your passion through school were you, was it were you actually trying heading towards acting then obviously you love we do much writing then well, what, what do you classify yourself no, more as more? Is your dream to be an actor who... Are you an actor who writes or you're a writer who acts? That's a tricky question. I'll get to that in a second. I'll, go, I'll answer the first okay. part first. So um, I don't think I was initially... I'd always write stories and everyone would like and enjoy the stories and I'd, and I'd partake in school plays and all that kind of thing. Um, but I never particularly wanted to be an actor or indeed a writer. For, I think writer... Well, I suppose writer possibly, but the idea of that actually being a job as such was a bit weird. I remember, like, you know, I think a lot of people writing my own Doctor Who adventures uh, in an exercise book when I was a kid that were, you know, dreadful. Um, though, having said that, every now and then I kind of go, oh, maybe I should lick that. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I think I was aware enough of how precarious a career it was, really, uh, that I was more interested in kind of doing something, but, like, I was, I was quite interested in being a lawyer or a, you know, a, a dentist was even an idea I quite liked. Um, but as my my parents, because they were, were very keen to encourage me to be an actor, it was in fact the exact opposite of like the way it tends to happen. So where where I as a school child was going, yes, I'd like to have a proper career and actual work, and my parents were going, no, go go be an actor, be an artist, do some of that sort of stuff. Um, so I ended up applying for various drama schools and uh, and and getting into a top one and feeling if anything, slightly on a, on a bound to go, because it was like one of the top two, Lambda. 
Um, yep. Um, and at certain points, it has been the top one, despite Rada probably having a, a better reputation in the world at large. People know Rada in a way they don't know about Lambda. Um, yeah, and I, I and I went there and I began to get into the idea of going, OK, maybe I will try and be an actor. Um, in terms of whether I'm, I'm an actor who writes or a writer who acts, I am whichever one I'm doing at any given time, which I know sounds like a bit of a cop-out answer, but it's sort of the only way I, could, the only way I can really do it. I love doing them both. Um, and certainly, I, I've done a lot of touring theatre, and I genuinely have no idea what I used to do during the day uh, before I was a writer, because you, you, you'll be kind of shouting in the evening for three hours, uh, and then you're just killing time the rest of the day. Um, and certainly if you're on tour, you, you go to some town you're not familiar with, there are only so many like stately homes you can visit, or movies you can go and see. Uh, so... So I've ended up now in this position where I will spend the day writing a script and I'll be acting in the evening sometimes. Also, I was at the, you know, the beginning of the year, I was on a tour. And um, and that's brilliant. I love that. And because each one makes the other one feel like the job. The one you're doing at that specific time is the fun one. So if I'm writing during the day, I'm thinking, oh, I, can, I, ju- I just have to make stuff up. I don't have to worry about remembering things and being heard and, and like moving around a stage. I don't have to worry about it. I can just make up stories. I can just have fun doing that. Um, and then in the evening when you're acting, you go, oh, this is brilliant. I don't, I don't have to... I, I can just do something I know inside out already. I, can, I just have to re- repeat the things I said yesterday. All that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, each one is the fun one to be doing at the time when the other one isn't around. Um, so, yeah, basically I'm both. I, I've often said, if people have asked me which, which one would you give up, I'd probably give up I'd probably give up acting first just on the basis that I feel I'm a bit easier to replace as an actor than I am as a writer. But, um, but I'd prefer not to do that. I'd prefer not to have to give up either of them. And it would be a weird scenario where I'd have to, really, yeah. I guess with the lockdown, you're forced to have the writing behind you. It's been... Yeah, easy to keep working. Yeah, it's been very easy to keep working, um, which I feel slightly guilty about, to be honest. You know, having had these vocals, as I say, I was midway through a tour when lockdown commenced, and you know, the producer director was fairly up, just checking everyone was okay, and I was having to go, "Yeah, I'm fine. What about you? You're, you've you've got loads of money invested in this. What's going on? And how is that?" I was more concerned about about the other people than me because I was basically fine. Um, writing audio drama in particular, which is something of a niche market, but um, absolutely uh incredibly well positioned uh for the uh for, for the pandemic really because i can keep writing actors can keep acting um i think i think there was maybe like a few weeks when when everybody wasn't quite sure of the procedure and who could work and whatever and i, th- so I think it was maybe like about march we were saying oh we're going to close the studios down so everything goes a bit on the back burner and then maybe about a week and a half later everyone suddenly realized oh hold on we can give people microphones. Not only can we give people microphones, a lot of the actors we've not been available, who, a lot of actors who it's been a struggle to get, are now suddenly available at the same time. Should we just should we just like work so much? So if anything, it was actually um, there was a it was I was working more than usual, I think, and at quite quite a speedy pace, but uh, not an uncomfortable pace. I always I'm always wary of saying working quickly. Because I think people that, that people can hear that and go, oh, they rush things. But I kind of think, no, no, I don't. I just kind of I'm aware that if I need to do something at pace, I just go, well, I'm not I'm not allowing myself my usual distractions. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna fanny about in the afternoon. I'm, I'm watching you know Babylon Five or something. I might actually just focus on writing a script for the whole of the day, things like that. So yeah, but so it went okay. It went okay. What's, what's your normal day look like? The normal day. Um, it, it it's during lockdown. I basically I, I was basically refusing working at weekends. I was I decided that they, the days could blend into one. Otherwise, um, that's not always the case. Um, it's one of the advantages of you know being sort of self-employed is you can go well. I might work on the Sunday and, t- and take the Wednesday off if there's something I wanted to be doing on the Wednesday. Um, the arbitrary choice of Sundays and Saturdays as a day off is a bit weird. But usually, what I do um, is I sort of get up and generally mooch into the day. I, I have what I talk about being an imaginary commute. I realised several years ago I wasn't reading as much as I used to be reading. Uh, and at least part of that was down to the fact I would only read on trains. And because I was working for a moment, I wouldn't go on trains that often. And then when I was on the train, it would be a little bit of an effort getting back into the book I'd been reading, so I'd end up doing a Sudoku or something. Um, so what I ended up going was, you know what? I took it as a, as a New Year's resolution. I thought, I, I will read a bit every day. 
and I'll sit down for half an hour, unless I'm actually going on the train that day, in which case I go, no, my, that will be a genuine commute, I'll read on that commute. Uh, but I basically would sit down and spend half an hour reading whatever book I was reading at the moment. And, you know, that can expand, expand or shrink or whatever it is. And um, and this year, because of lockdown, I've ended up, like, doubling the amounts. Not not least because I wasn't getting through the books quicker, quickly enough. I've got an enormous pile of about 500 books to get through, which would take me beyond my life at the moment. And it's really hard reading when you're dead. So um, <laughs> I, I thought I'd probably, like, double it up. I think, I was, again, during the... The early stages of, of lockdown, I was reading Tom Jones um, for research for the podcast I do, which is about the best picture winners, and Tom Jones had won best picture at the Oscars. Um, and if you look up my name on Twitter and and Tom Jones, you'll see that I semi live tweeted reading of it because it's it's borderline unreadable. Um, at the same time, kind of clearly quite good, but but basically unreadable. Um, and I just felt that I can't be doing this for fun. I've got to read something else. So I, I racked out um, the Sally Rooney book, Normal People, because that was being a, being shown on TV. And I thought, well, I'll watch this and then watch the the TV adaptation, which somehow manages to take longer to watch than to read the book, which is rare. Um, but yeah, that meant I was, was doubling out the art. So I do that in the morning. And then usually around about 11, I make a cup of tea to persuade myself to actually do some work and do some writing and feel that I'd probably got bored enough dicking around on the internet for the morning. Uh, and then I, I try to aim for about a thousand words a day at the very least, which is a, quite a small amount. Um, but then I'm doing other things, and and but that, otherwise, depending on the, the the sort of schedules, I can then zone in a bit more um, and uh, and focus in. And I've, I think the most I've got to is something like five thousand words in a day. Um, but that's because I was having an absolute ball, and you couldn't get me away from the computer. And sometimes, if I'm in that m- mode, then. Um, if, if I'm feeling in a productive mode and it's, I, I can get through a huge amount, a huge amount, and it kind of translates to other things. I'm quite attention deficit, so I do flit around a bit and kind of go, I'll just do a bit and then get bored and play a computer game or something like that, just to keep my mind active. But um, yeah, that, that I, I'm aware of what, what my deadline is and roughly how much I can do, and I try and aim to hit approximately that, um, just to make sure I'm I, I'm on time. But then you know, sometimes you go under and sometimes you go over and I, tr- I try not to force it but then at the same time sometimes you sort of have to a bit um because because it is a job and uh and and, and that, that's the thing some it, it, i'm not necessarily the best judge of it so if i'm kind of struggling with it it's still basically the same quality which is a bit you know frustrating really yeah where do you build your script editing into it because i'm just listening to cal at the moment and you mm. script edited that so you, you seem to script edit a lot of stuff at the moment how do you fit that in? Is that part? Of, do you count as writing time or something separate? I, it's still part of sort of the, the the work day. I tend to sort of break it down a little bit. So usually, if it's like a Doc Two, I'll do an episode at a time. Um, I, I feel that certainly that's because how I listen to them, and I and I don't want to kind of get too uh, cluttered with it. Um, it it generally just fits around around the other stuff, um, and uh, usually. It's a question of I'll write a bit and then I'll script edit an episode and then I'll go back and do some more scripting and then I'll script edit another episode. Uh, but again, this is entirely down to um, uh, differing timings and, and requirements and schedules. Um, and, and there are different ways of going about it. So uh, certainly if I'm working on like an overall series, and I think the clearest examples are things like Countermeasures and The Robots, uh, a lot of that is just like I'll do the individual little bits of work and tweak the stories and, and discuss them with the writers but then there's going to be the process of and now I just go back to the beginning and I read them all through uh, and just make sure I tweak them as they go along so that they all work as a unit which is less of a case with something standalone like say the Tom Bakers and stuff like that there's also a degree to which um, I try and nudge people along and uh and make suggestions of, of how to approach these. I think I've, I think I've figured some of that out over the years. There are a few things I, I, I was, I was unsure of in the early. It's something like I say a two-parter. I've got my my rules. I kind of, I say rules. My guidelines. I suggest to people. I was talking to someone about a two-parter, as in like a two half hours part story uh, over the weekend. Who is going to be writing one? And I was giving my two basic suggestions for that of how you kind of make one of those work and feel strong because I don't think they're, ne- they're necessarily 
intuitive in a way. It's this slightly weird thing of I, I, that the, I think someone will come in and do a two parter and kind of assume various things about how it works, whereas you have to be very aware that it has a different feel to say a one hour story or a four hour four part story or something along those lines. There are there are tricks to make it work that are slightly, I'd say, less obvious than than making those others work. Structural things that you might fall traps you might fall into. Um, just going a bit in terms of um, Doctor Who and your interest, how that all start with your Doctor Who interest? Oh, the first the first Doctor Who I ever saw was uh, genuinely the, the first ever episode, it, but not obviously on transmission. I'm too young for that. I hope it's obvious. And it was uh, in the Five Faces of Doctor Who repeat. I didn't watch the whole episode. My main memory of that is I think we switched over to watch some of it as or there not being anything else to watch at the moment. And my dad or my mum's going, oh, we should watch that. And I got a bit scared by the opening and we switched back just in time to see the end credits. Um, so that's, I think, my earliest memory of it. Uh, the first one I actually properly watched was a few episodes later. It was Carnival of Monsters, uh, which stuck in my head. And oddly, if I remember rightly... Um, they show Carnival of Monsters and Three Doctors the wrong way round in Five Doctors, in five, the Five Faces of Doctor Who season. Um, so that was the one I watched afterwards, and I, you know, I, and a lot of it I still remember watching at the time. And, and in some cases, wrongly, I, re- I had this very vivid memory of the, the Omega removing his helmet, being the cliffhanger where it isn't, and the actual cliffhanger for that episode is rubbish, um, and it really should be um, the removing of the helmet, um, which I hope Bob Baker doesn't hear me say. Um, yeah, uh, that that was that's the only thing, and then I think I was pretty much kind of addicted from that point. I watched the whole of um, of the Davison era live. I think actually I might have missed. I think I missed Warriors of the Deep on the original transmission. I was I was out of the country at the time, and it took me years to see Warriors of the Deep, which um, uh, I, I kind of genuinely really like Warriors of the Deep. I don't care what anyone says. So do I. So I like it too. Yeah, yeah, it's a great show. There, there's a, there's, a, I kind of love almost all of them, um, e- even the ones people tend to dislike. I kind of, I kind of love in a, in, in a slightly weird way. There were ones I, l- I love more than others, uh, but yeah, that it basically became my big thing over the years. I think you know I was a slightly Star Wars obsessed kid, and that might have been why my parents thought I might be interested in it. Uh, but it somehow got my imagination more than Star Wars ever did. I think, I think the wealth of other stories to explore, whether that was via. Um, uh, you know the novelizations or copies that a, a guy who worked with my mum in in the library had that he could loan me, so I could watch some of these old episodes um, or reading the comics. Everything there was such a wealth of material uh, that was easy and, and regular to access um, that, that Doctor Who always kind of became, you know, the, the, the one that was always going to be there for me and the one I love m- more than the others really. Um, so that was that was my way into it, and I yeah I um, obviously spent ages watching watching the classic series right up until you know the end of um, you know survival, a decade or so later. Okay, so you went to acting school to the London London Academy of Music and Dramatic uh, Art. Yes, that's right. Which I think Peter Davison went to as well. I don't think Peter did. Uh, oh, it could be wrong. I lose track of who went where. I, I have a faint feeling. I have a faint feeling someone did, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure any. Yeah, I'm off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you. Yeah. So then you so you did a bit of work touring, acting. Yes. Um, first couple of years of young life. How did you get connected then with the Big Finish? Um, it's through a sort of slightly roundabout way. Uh, there are various things that happened in terms of acting. I I um I bumped into Gary Russell at a convention in Sydney, Australia, as it happens, and and got chatting and got on with him quite well. Uh, I decided to not kind of push the I'm an actor and I'd like a gig thing because because you're obviously going well I'm just getting on with this guy as a person I don't want to kind of spoil that and then emailed him a bit later on um, I think I've talked about this somewhere else recently I can't remember where um, but I, I end up like getting a phone call from him saying would you like to do a big finish and and that was at the time when they'd like taken in open submissions uh, for writing as well so I didn't know whether I was coming in as an actor or as a writer and I was as an actor in this story uh, that became Faith Stealer, which is a lot of fun, and I still got a lot of affection for. Um, but yeah, that was how sort of big finish came. I I roughly around the same time as I'd left drama school was when um, Sirens of Time was released, and so I still remember sitting in my old drama school flat listening to the CDs. I didn't even have a CD player at this time. I borrowed my flatmate's CD player uh, to be able to listen to them on CD. Um, 
and um, yeah, it was a it was a very exciting time to be a Doctor Who fan, as I recall. Um, and I loved these; I absolutely loved them. I'd not had, I'd never quite connected as much with the novels. I think again, well, I'd, I'd read all of the New Adventures and the and not quite all of the New Adventures actually. I'd missed the Dying Days and I missed Cold Fusion, but I read all of them over time. But I I slightly drifted off with them because they were coming out roughly when I was at drama school. So the fact I so I didn't have much time. So coming out and then having the the performed drama and having my doctors back because that was initially who it was. It was my the, the big three I'd had as a kid, all of the, the, the John Nathan Turner doctors. Um, and the stories seemed so authentic and, and, and exactly what I wanted in a Doctor Who story. I did, I, I, I like the novels for what they were, but I really love the sort of the performed drama uh, thing a little bit more in terms of Doctor Who and the, 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 that sort of the pace. I think, as I say, it's, there's, there's, there's something you gain from the four episode format that I, I think people have often said about. Well, why why do we have to? Why can't we just have like two hour long episodes or just fill the CDs as long as it needs to be? And again, I think there's a, there's genuinely a different structural thing that happens. So a two part a, a a two half hour episode story is a different structure to a one hour stru- episode of Doctor Who, even though they look like they're the same from the outside. It's not just you bung a cliffhanger in the middle arbitrarily, even though sometimes that does kind of work. Um, it's that they have a different feel, and and what I really wanted in a Doctor Who was that kind of the pace and the uh, the shape that you gain from a, like something like a four parter, which is what a Big Finish was giving right at the beginning. And a lot of those early ones are just phenomenal. And I got quite involved. I was all, I was very keen to write for them for ages, and just I, I think because I I started writing uh, sometimes when I was at drama school, and indeed when I was at school, people kind of always viewed me as a bit of a writer, and I, it kind of just happened out of nowhere. And I'd write little short scenes and sketches. I ended up writing a play of my own when I was about 18, which is dreadful. Um, and then ended up writing a play I quite liked when I was about 21, when I was signing on and had, didn't have any acting work after I finished drama school. I just wrote this play that ended up um, getting performed as a, part of a Young Writers' Festival at the Royal Court, which is, you know, big theatre in London. And uh, and from that, winning another competition to write sketches for a radio show, all of which went, meant when I was submitting stuff to Big Finish in 2003 or five or whenever it was they did this open submissions thing, meant that I didn't get anywhere because I kind of rather arrogantly assumed, I go, well, if this idea isn't quite right. It might need a bit of work, but, you know, they'll see I've got a good CV and I might get in on that. No, obviously they got so many people sending in stuff that was bang on perfect or, or they'd worked so much harder than I weren't arrogantly assuming they could they'd be allowed to fix it in, in the edits um, that, 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 that I didn't get anywhere with those. Um, and I think that's always a, that's always a rule in terms of um, if anyone listening is interested in submitting stuff um, uh, to be finished, if it's something like a Paul Sprag or whatever, you are up against a hell of a lot of people. That's the thing. If you are submitting an idea, you want to submit the best Doctor Who story ever, or at least aim for that. I mean, I don't think you'll get that. I don't think I'd get that. Um, but what what you're aiming for is if you're aiming that high, you're going to hit somewhere that's close. You're going to get somewhere special. Whereas if you just think this is an idea for a Doctor Who story, yeah, you'll probably do an all right Doctor Who story. But there are loads of people out there who are submitting all right Doctor Who stories. You want something that makes you stand out, I think. Um, the eventual route I got in, um, in terms of the writing, was via Sapphire and Steel. Um, I, 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 when I got turned down for this idea that I'd written... Uh, I thought, don't waste an idea, which is a useful an, another useful tip, I think. And rather than have my idea turned, I go, well, I, I can't do a Doctor Who then. How else can I get into the company? He's going, I bet no one's submitting for the Tomorrow People. I don't think anyone's submitting Tomorrow People ideas. Why don't I pitch that? And that got me through to um, pitching for Saffron Steel. And then there's a really convoluted set of circumstances where I don't, I, I've said afterwards, I don't think Nigel Fares, who was producing Sapphire Steel and Tomorrow People, actually read the storyline at that point because there wasn't a series underway and I think he might have forgotten about it. Gary Russell gets a job on the TV series. Uh, Nigel has to write a replacement script really quickly and it happens to have the same setting as the one I did, which was a, 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 rehe- a, a nursing home. And so when he, he finds out about this, he reads it in a panic. He goes, oh, actually, that's quite good. We'll do this one if you could put it in a different setting. And so that's how I got in on the first one. And I wrote my Saffron Steel that then led to the other Doctor Who's. Um, so were you writing before you were acting for Big Finish? Um, no, I think I acted first. Because uh, so, so it was about 2005 was Faith Stealer. And then I think it was probably maybe about two or three years... Um, I feel it was around... You know, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to work out the maths of when it would be. 
Um, when I, yeah, because it would have to be something like about maybe about 2007, 2008 is the saffron steel. But 2005 was face sealer because it was roughly as the um, the TV series was coming back. And so the whole series got truncated, as I recall, uh, the Divergent Universe stuff. Um, yeah, that was... Um, that was my, my, my journey in and then slowly from that and then I built up connections by doing conventions and stuff like that which was the other aspect of it so I was able to like email David Richards and say I've written this can I write a companion chronicle please and things like that so uh, which all helped towards getting it and then so it was your first companion chronicles I think uh, first released companion chronicle it was the second one I wrote oh. the first one I wrote Shades of Grey uh, yeah um, Echoes of Grey was the first one I wrote Echoes of Grey. Um, and if anything, there is, I think, one sentence in there that I can largely hang a lot of my big finished career on. Because that's, again, that's the other thing. You need something to stand out. And I think it was the line that David particularly liked in that was, uh, I am Zoe Harriet. I remember everything and I remember nothing. Which, oh, okay. to be fair, is a damn good line. Um, it, it, I, I feel I can say that because it's 12, year old, 12 years ago me rather than me. Um, I kind of anytime I listen back to anything that old like listening to Solitaire again at some point maybe like about five six years ago I just went oh this is quite good I've no idea who wrote it it isn't me Um, because it feels very different the the world has moved on my way of writing has moved on so it's always changed Um, that was I think the bit that got that for whatever reason I think David really liked that script and uh, then asked me back to do Solitaire, and Solitaire was, I think, the one where it all just came together. It was a, it was a very um, fortuitous thing. I'm a massive sort of board gamer, so the idea of writing for the Celestial Toymaker kind of absolutely fitted into what I wanted to do really well. Because I'd also thought about a lot about games and about how there, there was like a particular thing I'd done on tour where we'd been playing a game of Trivial Pursuit, and I found it really fascinating watching how it affected different people and how I reacted and how other people... There was, a, um, there was a, woman there, a woman in the cast who was very determined that she was the smartest person in the room because she was a professor of something or other at a, some sort of university and hadn't clocked that one of the other actors was you know, an Oxford-educated historian who just happened to go, well, I'll just become... I'll just do Trivial Pursuit. No, I'll just become an actor. And we're playing this game of Trivial Pursuit and um, the Oxford Educated one wasn't giving too much of a toss about it. It was like giving clues to everyone, which would annoy me because I think, no, I want to get this right. I want to get this right. I don't want clues. I want to know it. Um, and then, because there's, there's that part of me going, no, I want to play the game properly. I don't, want, I, I don't see the point of doing it if we don't play it properly, which was my, is my kind of vibe of it. And then the woman who wanted to be the smartest person in getting re- terribly annoyed about any like minor in. in minor mistake or whatever and kind of there was a huge argument about whether kabuki theater was a form of dance or a form of theater and it's just this bit of going oh <laughs> god this is we're literally playing trivial pursuit it, and so and so it made me think a lot about how games work and so and because i got a playwriting background and all of that the idea of doing a two-hander between the two of them uh absolutely fired my imagination and i think meant uh I, I, that, that's why i think that one kind of was a bit lightning in the bottle, really, of just being the, the combination of the right person and the right idea at the same time. I mean, Companion Chronicles was for a long time my favourite series because I thought yeah. it was so imaginative and every writer was taking very outrageous options to have a very small cast. Yeah. And so they were taking risks that, yeah, that's what I loved about it. Now, according to my um, rough looking, you've written over 85 shows for Big Finish and you've acted in over 50. Does that sound about right to you? <laughs> it's it's borderline. I I I made a list uh, recently. I was quite curious. I think I might have just written my hundredth script. It depends how you count it, though. That's the thing. There, there's a point where you kind of go. Well, I was looking at the list, going. Well, I've got I've got the English Way of Death and Romance of Crime in here, and and you know, do they count? Do they count? I don't know. And then other things where you're going. Oh, it is better watch out and Fairy Tale of Salzburg. Is that one story or is that two? How do they? How do they add up? It's one. It's one. It's this one thing. One. Yeah, I, th- I think it, it's it's a very tricky thing to add up. So I th- it, I think it's somewhere. Yeah, it's in that kind of ball- ballpark. Obviously, there are a few which have been written and and recorded that haven't been announced yet. There's, I think, definitely a few for like twenty. I think I've, I've got at least something in twenty twenty two. I think I think I've got something in twenty twenty four that's been recorded. Things like that. Um, is this some of the Tom Baker stuff or other things? Yeah, I could probably, I don't know if I can say, but pr- pr- that's probably not too far <laughs> out of the, 
that the kind of the idea but it's not necessarily yeah there, there's there's all manner of things it's um I'm, I'm never sure quite how the how the announcement rates work really but um i was quite surprised to discover that we were like announcing you know the tom baker run for 2024 go oh okay we've got we've told everyone about that this weekend have we fantastic lovely but yeah I, I i appreciate they kind of do these things in their own sort of rhythm so i try to avoid talking about any i haven't done but yeah that sounds about the right kind of about the right kind of numbers. I'm throwing in the Avengers there, obviously, and uh, again with the Avengers, even though some of those are adaptations. Ago, well, if it was an original episode I adapted from a TV script, that doesn't count. But the ones where I've that, that script doesn't exist, and I've had to extrapolate a plot from the TV script, that counts. It's a, it's I, I don't know. These things, the, the, the maths become kind of a bit baffling in terms of acting. Yeah, it probably is about fifty. Or something. I, again, I slightly lose count because there are some where I've like turned up as guests and episodes and recorded it like so for example faith zero i recorded a cameo for the last on the same day sometimes with the, some of the tom bakers i've been in the studio so i've just recorded on the basis of there's someone around I, and, and occasionally in those i think it's death match i think i was around in the studio and i think i i think i'm something like the knight who gets killed at the beginning of the story and i remember listening to that and hearing this knight getting killed off and it took me maybe about two or three minutes to go oh, hold on i think that might be me just by virtue of there being like some sort of phraseology or the way he... Because obviously they've, they've tweaked the voice and done some sort of effect on the voice to the degree that I just think I, I wasn't able to recognise my own voice. But then there's something about my phraseology and the way I hit the beats where I thought, oh, I think that might be me. I'm not 100% sure, but I think that's me. Because obviously we record them so long ago, a lot of the times that in terms of like those bit parts, you go, I don't know. I might have said something. I probably did. Yeah. I had a look through um, the Big Finish website today and did a search with your name. Well over 300 Big Finish productions with your name attached to it in some form or another. And I thought, what do I talk to John about? Obviously, we'll talk uh, about some of the more recent stuff. But are there, over the years, are there any particular highlights personally for you from your, your oh. work with Big Finish? Oh, that's the thing. They're kind of, they all kind of... There are a lot of them I really love. Um, and, uh, there is a degree to which... They all kind of work like trains. You, I seem to remember for a while I thought Foe from the Future was my favourite. Um, that's I'm still very proud of that. I think it's got the right sort of epic sweep and there's sort of like an early Tom Baker one. I feel it was it was a really good opener for me. Obviously, I've got a lot of fondness for Solitaire. Really love Trouble with Drax. That's one where if any time everyone says if you'd kind of like adapt one for TV, that's probably the one I'd pick just because I think it's it's ridiculously audacious. Um, we reviewed it a couple of weeks ago as one of our favourites. Yeah, it's fun. I, I mean, I, I, it feels weird like saying these things about your own stuff because it seems smug. But as I say, so many of them I wrote years ago that it feels like I didn't. And so Trouble with Drax, I, I do remember the, the, the amount of effort going into the plotting of that because it had to make sense every single time. Uh, and I'm avoiding saying too much about what it is, but you know what I mean with that, that every single time you get, and, and this, and it's, the plot up to that point had to still make sense. Um, with each new change, each new um, development. I think towards the end I slightly cheat with the final one because it, it, it's just there as showing off as a bit of a flourish. But it, um, <laughs> that one I kind of, that one I really love. Um, the whole of Doom Coalition, actually, and by that I'm including um, Matt's stuff as well and, and the rest, of, the whole like 16th this I think as an ep- has an epic sweep that I, I really adore. I like the whole sort of shape of that. If, if anything, the only one I kind of am slightly less keen on is probably Stop the Clock. Even though I think it's a good episode, it, it's not quite what I'd have wanted for the finale. It's the one where I kind of go, that's the one I love. I love all of the other ones from Do- I wrote for Doom Coalition. That's the one I kind of go, yeah, that kind of that kind of works. But it's it's not as... I like the others more. I Actually, I, I, I don't dislike it. I always feel slightly uncomfortable about saying I dislike any of mine because... Because other people will love them, but I don't dislike it. I quite like it, but I like the others more. Whereas I think that Day of the Master, for example, is what I want a finale to be. That was that one. I thought, no, that works. That just nails the ending. I'm very happy with that. Yeah, and just you know, bits of I loved. I loved doing the Omega Factor um, as an actor. That was fun, uh, and just getting a chance to work with Louise, which is always um, an absolute delight. She's always very generous and praising of my of my stuff, and uh, and is, delivers it well. And we have we have a good time with it, really. Um, those feel like they're some of the, the, the major ones there's bound to be other things I've forgotten you know when, I, the Avengers I love doing the Avengers um, love doing lo- love working with the, the McGann team that feels like it's just a lovely lovely thing to be doing the, 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 the current you know Liv, Helen and the Doctor there's almost always something I kind of love most of the time I'm just very I mean I'm always excited by the next one and what one I'm doing at the moment there's a there's a like a, a, a two disc disc story coming up sometime next year that I haven't 
been announced as writing, so I probably can't say what it is or where it is, but it is... It's a thing, it's a, like a two-disc, it's not a four-parter, it's a two-parter across two discs. You'll probably be able to guess what it is when it comes out. That's one of the ones where I go, well, I love that one to bits. That was one where I just enjoyed writing it so much I couldn't get away from the from the computer, really. Yeah, there are loads that just have, have a ball doing. Oh, actually, the, the most recent one I've done as well, I'm very excited by. I'll give you the initials of that one that because that'll init- indicate what one when it is not <laughs> after the fact you'll go yeah it is m i m that one's i loved that one i had such a ball doing that and the, and the two-parter I'll, gi- I'll give you the initials of that one because that won't give anything away bt is the first episode and the second episode is called t w w there you go that, that, that's that's completely unhelpful but you'll know when you, you're i mean that and again that's not to say the other ones suck was there anything as a script editor that came across your desk that you looked at and it absolutely blew you away um with with what hit you often it's writers it's it's the the, the first time of coming across a new writer who's who's a, who's really good at the gig is always such a delight uh, I, I have talked about this before. I think occasionally people think that Big Finish can be a bit of a closed shop and you don't kind of want people going, well, I want to write all of these and all that sort of thing. And I kind of don't. Um, because what people forget in terms of like looking for new writers and so on is that is that I am a script editor and, and a really good new writer makes my life easy. Um, and makes me kind of go, yeah, this is... I can just... Want to. So I remember... Any time it's somebody new where it's just really good... Um, sticks with me so um, it's things like The Transcendence of Ephros which was the first time I worked with Guy Adams and just re- reading that through and go oh we, can we use this guy all the time please can we just literally nothing but this guy and you know Night Witches with Roland Moore that was another one that was brilliant and, and you know Matt Fitton the first time I, I worked with Matt Fitton was on Countermeasures and again that was just came through and it was really just lovely and clean and solid and amazing I seem to remember even like the, there was another Matt Fitton script earlier this year which I just remember coming through and spending an hour or so just reading it through the first time and, and I think I even tweeted about it afterwards just going, well, that one's just gorgeous. And it's it's not going to be... It, and this to sounds it sounds in a weird way we're going, it's probably not going to be anyone's favourite episode. It's, it's not going to necessarily win any awards or anything like that. It's just an episode that was so clean and clear and perfect. Uh, just as it's so well constructed and told, and uh, that I just got to the end and thought, oh god, he's just a master of this. Yeah, there, I, I'm I'm trying to remember if there are any others that kind of uh, immediately leap at me, like specific stories. It, it, it's usually just the sense. It's not necessarily the stories as much as the sense of reading these things, going, oh, this just is done so effortlessly and is pulled together so with such ease. You know, like doing this occasional stuff in their fountain, say, or something like that, where where it just feels like you know that that, um, that you're just watching. You, I always talk about certainly from a writing perspective, and sometimes from a script editing perspective. You think, well, I've got the best seats in the house here. I get to be the first person to. If I'm writing something, I think I'm the first person to hear that line of dialogue. And I'm, if I'm reading something, I go, I've got. I'm like one of the first people to read a script by this writer or this writer or this writer. And I'm feeling I've got this very privileged position uh, of, of working through it. Um, yeah, that's what. That's the ones I kind of. Where it really kind of leaps out at me and excites me, I'd say most of the time. Yeah. Can we just b- borrow into a couple of them a bit, a bit more depth? Because it's kind of, I mean, yeah, that's fantastic. Um, in terms of acting, Omega Factor was a big starring role you had over a couple of seasons. Um, how, how did that role come about, and how did you approach? Because I mean, I think Louise, Louise was following into a character that she had played thirty years earlier, but yours was a son of a character. How, how do you approach the whole? leading man thing well it's interesting I mean the part came about I was just offered it um, I knew that they were doing the Omega Factor I wasn't particularly involved um, it wasn't a series I knew terribly well but I knew they'd been doing it and um, then I think I got just an email out of the blue saying right we've been talking about this we'd quite like you to be in it um, which was a sort of a surprise to me I've never particularly kind of like um, asked to be in things or kind of put my name forward for things um, so you know, it was it was very flattering to be asked, basically, um, and I, I was obviously delighted to say yes. In terms of approaching it, it's, I, I, there's not really a massive difference from how I'd approach any other part, really, which is just, you know, you read the script as often as you can and try and say it out loud and talk it through and, and, and look for those, the clues about the personality. But um, in, in a good script, the character kind of leaps off the page at you a lot of the time. And that's what I felt with, with Adam. I kind of got a very clear sense of him from very early on, I think. 
and that meant you know I, I was largely just led by being in the room and, and finding my way into it yeah I think that's just the way I tend to approach almost any part really the, the, everyone is the lead in their own story that's the other thing as well you know it, um, a, lead, a lead character is obviously the lead and has the most lines or whatever uh, but a supporting role they're the lead as well so you shouldn't really be approaching it any differently I don't think they they, they are the head of their own story so um, yeah just going over it I did try and watch I watched some of the episodes of the original series and just to get a sense of, of that but again largely it's just like going with instinct and let, being led by the script really and the scripts were so well put together I, they, they just kind of did all the work for me I think had you worked with Louise much before that? Um, yes, from the writer's perspective. I'd written and script edited a lot of her stories for the, the Tom stuff, and I'd written a couple of episodes of Jago and Lightfoot that she'd been in, where I think we, I think that might have been the first time we met. But uh, we'd always got on, and um, you know, sometimes I'd stay at her house when, when I was recording down in Tunbridge Wells and all that kind of thing. So um, it, it was very much kind of natural, relaxed re- re- conversation we could have between the two of us. We got on basically very well so um yeah that would um that that, it, that just made life easier but yeah we've definitely worked together a reasonable amount but um i got to know her very well during that and uh, you know worked with her on a lot of things ever since really mm. so a normal day for you as an actor um so do you, do you generally record an episode a day is that how you it works or is it more complex than with other box sets a disc a day a disc a day depending on yeah so if it's if it's an uh, that's not always the case something like say uh, the Sherlock Holmes I did, I think we did pretty much in one day for a two-hour two-hour script. But um, yeah, the uh, it, it's usually an hour a day uh, with occasional tweaking depending on circumstances. Yeah, that was that, that's how we did the Omega Factor as well. It's basically yeah, turn up whenever your call is, usually ten in the morning, and loiter in the green room and, until you're asked to do it. Sometimes so directors work in different ways. Sometimes it can be quite all over the script sometimes they try their very best to make it sort of chronological yeah I was in studio I think it was last week recording something and literally in studio no it's a week and a half ago now um, time goes very quickly in lockdown and um, yeah I, uh, I I think I was like in quite early on the beginning playing one character and then didn't appear for about half an hour in the script terms and that basically meant that I sat outside typing a script of my own till about three o'clock until like post lunch before I was called back in to, to, to give my performance again yes Okay, so uh, it, there's. Uh, I was hoping this was going to be more Omega Factor, but at the moment, it doesn't look like they has that ended. It's not more Omega Factor, no, no. Um, it's uh, as far as I'm aware, that's ended at the moment. There's always the possibility of it coming back for something else. Yeah, I'd say. There's something coming, Adam. Him, but not him. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions. The Omega Factor, Series 3. There are CCTV cameras being placed all over my office, my lab, in the corridors. She was discovered asleep. Yes, you said. Floating half a metre above the ground. She's been suffering from blackouts. Wakes up, no idea where she's been, covered in dirt. You are about 12 weeks into the pregnancy. No, not possible. But horror needs support. She's getting... She needs to be seen for who she is. Her story needs to be listened to. Why are you here, Edward? What do you want? Pointless. Worthless. Without worth. Listen to me, Adam. I'm begging you. Don't leave me to suffer in darkness. I'm assuming Department 7 hasn't led Omega to what it's really after. I wish for Jake. Dead ten years. I wish my mum was back too. There! Claire, you mustn't! You can stuff your experiments! Just send them away! Make them go! What's been trapped? This is a power. I believe in the Holy Spirit. This is a whole place is being torn apart. You will submit. You will serve. Immortality. Big finish. We love stories. Time to play. And that's where we'll leave our interview with John Dorney for this episode of The Sirens of Audio. It's been great chatting to him, and um, part two will be dropping on the 1st of November, so make sure that you uh, you stick around for that, and he's got some very insightful uh, things to say uh, on the next instalment. So, you know, people ask me about listening to audio drama, and you know why I say you should listen to it? Because audio drama... Raw! Raw!